So I'm going to start, um, since uh, the heading of this year's uh, sub uh, Subversive Festival carries the word democracy in its title, and let us first pinpoint the meaning of democracy and what it really stands for in capitalism. So in um, capitalist states, of course, democracy has always been the concept and uh, the actual rule of government connected with the moneyed and propertied classes, while the seemingly diverse party system has functioned only as a smokescreen for promoting the interests of different fractions of the same property owning a need. And of course, that insistence on patriarchy and gendered expectation also falls into the context of our Western capitalist democracies. Um, so with the destruction of uh, socialism and also, uh, we might say, the reimposition of uh, capitalist social relations and reinstallment of the so-called social democracy, what we are facing today are very intense processes of uh, women's redomestification and of course repatriarchalization of society and all of this takes place under the pretext of women's uh, or women-friendly policies. <laughs> First, to explain what uh, the uh, conjunction between capitalism and patriarchy is. Capitalism has always been, of course, dependent on gendered exploitation of women, and it is for this reason that uh, capitalism also keeps reinventing patriarchy alongside constructs of femininity and masculinity, regardless of the different forms that capitalism itself might take, be it neoliberalism or its earlier stages. So feminization of poverty, as, uh, as uh, today's uh, dictation goes, is not something that uh, comes along uh, with neoliberalism, but of course it has always been entrenched in different kinds of uh, capitalist versions of the breadwinner model. So capitalism has consistently uh, reconceptualized uh, the burden of uh, care for children and also by extension for the elderly, the sick and the disabled as something that is associated solely and entirely with the individual. So this individualism is not just a matter of neoliberalism, it has always been part and parcel of capitalism as such. So capitalism primarily rests on uh, the redefinition of social reproductive work as a matter of private and individual concern, always private and individual concern, rather than social and connective responsibility. So this kind of redefinition enables uh, capital owners to cast aside their social responsibility, but of course this means they would actually in this way dispense with huge but essential costs that are necessary for the basic reproduction and regular upkeep of the current and future labour force. So it is for this reason that um, within capitalist framework, women are posited as a specially designated group of people who should do this kind of social reproductive work out of love and for free in the privacy of their homes, supposedly as a natural extension of uh, uh, the assigned femininity. And of course, once again, this kind of redefinition of social reproductive work as women's free labour and personal service allows capital owners to download and in this way avoid huge financial costs associated with the reproduction and maintenance of their own labour force, which of course in turn translates into a direct increase in their own private wealth. So disinvestment in social reproduction means a direct accumulation of capital, of course. <laughs> With the reinstallment of capitalism, what we are witnessing, of course, is precisely this, a major disinvestment on the part of newly fledged capital owners in the social uh, reproduction of uh, humanity and their current and future labour force. And this translates also in uh, reduced uh, uh, paternal and maternity leave analysis, but also in either in a retrenchment or a complete dismantling of public care facilities, both for the elderly and primarily for the children. So in this way, by downloading uh, social reproduction as um, non-work, uh, by redefining this as non-work, uh, it means that uh, women are being once again constructed as primarily home-confined domestic carers and uh, services, 
and at the same time with this disinvestment into public care facilities they are also being reconstructed as secondary earners so primarily uh, primarily uh, free uh, care providers and at the same time only uh, secondary earners so women are pushed back into the privacy of homes in various ways so primarily either as informal carers or free um, reproductive labourers and only by extension as secondary workers in the labour market. So today what we are witnessing are intense uh, processes and trends towards pushing women into specially designated uh, and noted uh, job positions like part-time work and of course a home-based industrial or uh, for that reason a uh, service uh, work and this of course leads to the feminization of poverty but in the meantime capitalist states have instituted a new version of liberal feminism. This is the kind of feminism which of course does not question the system as such but primarily acts as an aid to these policies like for example the, uh, the maintenance, the promotion of part-time jobs and industrial homework and so on. Uh, primarily we are talking about the NGOization of uh, feminism which of course is also uh, sooner or later now in this, uh, in this um, geopolitical place here it's going to be specialised in micro credits in giving out micro credits just as well so one of the major um, premises of liberal feminism is either the focus on the quotas and it does not actually ask which women are capable of uh, entering these positions at all. So considering that uh, we are talking about the retrenchment or dismantling of uh, social services, uh, the privatisation of care in a double sense, in the sense that uh, uh, low income women are being pushed out of the labour market entirely, uh, uh, with the remaining uh, social services like uh, uh, kindergartens being exorbitantly priced, and uh, very much reduced in number, the network has been uh, dismantled and reduced in number, so this creates a scarcity but at the same time inaccessibility in terms of uh, prices that are charged even in, um, uh, public, uh, in public facilities. So the idea is to track women into two kind of categories. Uh, so on the one hand you have low income women uh, who uh, exit the labour market primarily because of the inaccessibility of childcare facilities either because of their reduction in number or because of their price inaccessibility. And on the other hand, uh, and these women are then uh, encouraged to take on part-time jobs uh, or actually home-based or industrial work. And this is also the policy that is now going to be pursued in Croatia. At the same time, maternity leaves and parental, announce, parental leave announces are no longer, they no longer count for 100% replacement of a woman's wage but uh, they have been minimised in various ways. Either they are paid at a flat, uh, in a flat rate uh, a component, which uh, of course is like subsistence level, and this uh, means that uh, uh, when women actually take out these leaves, they are at least partially dependent upon their partners. Uh, so um, we are witnessing this uh, double tracking. So on the one hand, uh, women um, coming from the financial need uh, uh, and the privileged, uh, environment that they are channeled into this, uh, whereas uh, upper class women are, and these are the policies now introduced with uh, individual child minders, uh, will be able actually to uh, download uh, the, uh, the costs of uh, reproduction to the informal sector primarily. So, but uh, when it comes to this liberal feminism, uh, of course, uh, uh, NGOs uh, come in handy just as well because they serve a double function. So on the one hand, they function as a poor substitute for the shrinking and disappearing welfare state uh, whose uh, provisions have been decimated and increasingly services are being provided much more cheaply by NGOs with the array of volunteers and only a small crew of professional technical staff. So uh, NGO, uh, NGOs are encouraged to take on care work just as well, for example if we take a look at Latin America or other kind of uh, social services just as well. And of course um, um, uh, secondly, behind this process of NGOization lurks also the depolitization and in a way neutralization of potential grass, grassroots movements uh, of those who have been dispossessed 
and who might develop clearly defined political agendas that change the status quo had it not been for the imposition of the NGO's strategies. But what we are going to witness in our, in our place here is very likely that NGOs, you know, women's NGOs, will also take on uh, the so-called uh, microcredit services, or actually they will become intermediaries uh, between uh, the banking sector and, of course, uh, the uh, locally impoverished uh, women who have been either let go from the public sector and so on. So um, uh, microcredit lending also comes into picture right here. And of course, microcredit lending is directed uh, towards um, uh, women who in one way or another have been let go. So, and uh, this is touted as once again as a women-friendly policy, as a way to empower women, but despite of this gloss of women's empowerment, and of course with the retreat uh, of the welfare state, and also the shrinking employment opportunities for women in the public sector, uh, the goal is primarily to push women into, once again, informal sector work. And this leads to a stepping up of women's domestic and childcare duties uh, with uh, the unpaid uh, work environment within this unpaid work environment of their home, while it also restricts uh, their demands for fair wages once women, of course, are relocated from the so-called uh, formal sector into a semi-informal or highly informal sector. So the underpaid labour of these poor entrepreneurs uh, who are, are in one way or another aided by being able to access microcredits. Uh, so the, 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 the underpaid neighbour of these poor entrepreneurs is made available to subcontractors usually or to some other um, intermediaries that operate on behalf of huge retail and other corporate chains or just individual private companies. So and under the pretext of women's empowerment and this humanitarian assistance which is extended by NGOs in conjunction with uh, the banking sector, uh, women are once again incorporated into the capitalist system of gendered exploitation, once again primarily via home-based work. <laughs> And that's why it is also important to um, divest ourselves from these chains of um, capitalist um, organization of civil society. This is very important. So what, it, um, what we need, uh, in fact, is a socially engaged feminism, the kind of feminism that itself would be focused on structural inequalities and, of course, systematic, uh, systematic uh, exploitation. So, uh, this is not about uh, uh, trying to focus on individual separate issues, but understanding the system as a whole. So what we need is a systematic approach. And that's why it is of essential importance for feminism itself to become rematerialized. In other words, uh, to become socially engaged is to think about alternatives which are not just reformist, but transformative in um, and actually run in opposition and about capitalism. So that's why feminism needs to get re, uh, needs to get rematerialized in the sense that any that it must understand that any kind of struggles, meaningful struggles against injustices, are struggles against imperialism. They are struggles against uh, uh, the uh, systematic exploitation, and that's why this is a struggle uh, that needs to do away with the structures of the capitalist society itself. Uh, what has the effect is already this, namely the concept of remodified family wage and of course the concept of the breadwinner model. It's not gone. Uh, people have in mind that the breadwinner model means only uh, uh, the woman stays at home and uh, the partner works. Not at all. So part-timing and uh, this kind of home-based work is a form of supplementary labour and supplementary pay. That's why women are constructed as secondary earners. So the breadwinner model is not gone. It is remodified as a one and a half model, we say, whereby the woman actually earns only half of what she would actually earn if uh, she had uh, full uh, labour rights, so to say, and access to the market. But before before we get down to this, to, uh, to the answer to this question, which is a typical question that unionists, for example, would pose, we have to understand that the concept of the family wage is also directly related to uh, the, um, uh, the shedding of uh, 
social reproduct, uh, reproduction maintenance costs are the part of the capitalists because they say, well, a social reproduct, uh, reproduction is something that will be done in the privacy and consequently does not need any kind of payment and consequently also the wages of men, working partners, are lower as a result of that. So there is a direct correlation. So the family wage then means whatever the partner earns, it's never, uh, for the majority of the people, it's never sufficient enough. The notion of the family wage is a myth because it, uh, it means that people would still have to supplement the minimal income with some additional activities in order to reach the basic minimum standard of living. So that's why when even if we look back in history, when family wages would be paid, children would have to go out to work immediately as soon as possible in order to supplement the income of the father. So the myth of the family wage, all of this is connected. But of course, um, the idea is not that uh, women suppress the wages of the men. On the contrary, it's the systematic organization of different kind of segregated uh, neighbor power and differentially valorized neighbor power, which uh, all of these factors intermesh. And we must not forget about the huge reserve army of the unemployed, be it men or women, who actually keep uh, suppressing the wages just as well. So some Sometimes people would say, oh, it's, uh, it is a typical, I would even say, it's a typical, um, it's a typical focus of unionists. This was a typical focus of the unionists in the 1920s and the 1930s who would put up resistance against the inclusion, brought the inclusion of women into the neighbor force by trying to defend uh, the separate interests of the men. And th this would actually result in artificial divisions between men and women versus actually looking at the system as a whole. So that's why uh, socialism versus guild unions. So this is an artificial opposition, right? And it was counted, it was counted upon, it was uh, highly boosted actually, so as to really further uh, to exclude women also from trade unionism just as well. It depends on the course of action and thinking that individual unions would take. But this was primarily what was entrenched with the main unions, the, uh, the unions that were, that were also recognised as social partners, even though this word, uh, word was not actually used at the time. In fact, they were not really recognised as social partners proper, but this was uh, uh, the direction. <laughs> Probably you mean uh, this mantra that uh, after the Second World War, with the, the advance of technology and so on, this would also, if this is this is one of the typical arguments presented, that women would be liberated from the household chores and uh, they would also be able to enter the neighbour force. But they never discussed that women after the Second World War in capitalism, if they entered the neighbour force, it was under the restricted conditions and primarily once again as part timers, primarily as part timers. So, um, on the one hand, state capitalism would also promote a particular kind of a welfare state. So we have to also differentiate between different types of welfare state because it's not just all about production, the way the production itself is organised and who, uh, how sur uh, surplus uh, um, uh, neighbour, of course, all this income is actually divided. It also has to do with the uh, organisation of the social welfare state. And in capitalism, um, um, we differentiate between three different types, but uh, the main distinction is that uh, liberal welfare states uh, would uh, s target selective groups, uh, for example, among uh, women, they would target only the poorest among the poor and provide some sort of alleviation, which is, also, which is an extension of the old charity or nobleness largest system. On the other hand, you have uh, the so-called corporate uh, conservative system, a typical of uh, Central Europe, like Germany and Austria, uh, whereby incentives would be given uh, in the form of marital, marital tax relief, for example, for the woman to stay at home or to have only so and so much income in comparison to the men, which was what was directly encouraged by these incentives, and stipends just as well, like uh, um, child uh, allowances and so on, would be to 
uh, to still keep the um, breadwinner model going and these kind of incentives would be a minimal uh, loss of uh, capital for uh, the capital owners in comparison to the erection of an extensive and of course working uh, um, public system whereby uh, people would be also employed on a full-time basis. So uh, state capitalism uh, this kind of social services that are promulgated as a sort of a new deal and uh, the new deal policies just as well would not actually improve the situation of women. They would just reorganize the breadwinner model and once again the tendency is always to shed the costs of reproduction. So socialism on the other hand would provide full individual rights, uh, so pension rights, uh, um, uh, uh, health, uh, uh, health insurance and so on. So state capitalism on the one hand, even though policies are modified and they are governed by the, the central bureaucracy, so to say, this is still the extension of the corporate and capitalist system. So with the snatching of this welfare state, what we, uh, what we are witnessing is further reduction in already minimal or medium social allocations which never ever worked towards the uh, full citizenship for example on the part of women. So state capitalism versus socialism, even those who say what we need today is Keynesianism, uh, do not realize that Keynesianism helped once again just to keep capitalism going and it is in no way applicable to socialism. And those who actually promote uh, or actually talk about the New Deal, for example, as a sort of a alleviation that would keep uh, capitalism and made it like state capitalism, because in uh, the United States uh, the Roosevelt policies are interpreted as a form of state capitalism. Uh, well, uh, people who do not know the history of uh, this New Deal do not know that the employment rate was kept uh, high because women had to leave their posts. Women had to leave their posts and uh, nowadays we have exactly the same kind of a reflection uh, of this, for example, in the sense that uh, parental leaves are being deliberately extended so that women are kept out of the labour force and they count as uh, the unemployment statistics go down because these kind of policies, uh, they are interpreted, uh, parental leaves are interpreted as a form of employment. Yeah? So this is state capitalism for you. Um, I mean, if, uh, because we have to, uh, I'm not talking just about the means of production, I'm talking about the organisation of the so-called social welfare system, which in capitalism has functioned as a form of cooptation uh, for, and Bismarck would also say this um, explicitly, so we have to give some concessions, not many, and we have to give targeted concessions so that we co-opt co uh, co uh, certain segments, primarily middle class and upper middle class, so that it actually uh, works in alliance uh, with uh, the capitalist state. And the idea was to um, uh, nip in the bud, so to say, potentially revolutionary movements that would actually require a complete uh, change of the system and justice rather than cooptation. So we have to understand state capitalism is n not parallel to socialism by no means. And I have provided just a few fragments of an ins uh, insight into this, but what is required is actually a much more uh, extensive uh, explanation. <laughs>